Hi guys. Go ahead and type your ID in the chat box, please. Good afternoon, guys. Go ahead and um, add your ID numbers into the chat box, please. Thank you, Owen and Sebastian. Thank you, Emmanuel. It's good to see you here. Thanks, Haley. You guys feel free to unmute yourselves unless you have a lot of background noise. It's nice to hear your voices. The rest of you who are joining us, please add your IDs to the chat box, please. Wow, it looks like we're going to have a big group today. This is awesome. Thank you, Kira. The rest of you who are just joining us, please add your chat box. Thank you, Haley. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, Sienna. Wow, you guys are. Thanks, Christelle. Neptali. I just um, need your ID, please. Alejandro, I don't know why you can't hear me. Check your mic. Oh. All right, so let me just check on everybody here. Azaria, Christelle, Diana, Emmanuel, Haley. Owen, Samuel, Sienna. Okay, everybody has logged in except for, okay, now I have you too, Alejandro. Thank you. How are you feeling, Alejandro? Alejandro, can you hear me? Okay. Let me write. Alejandro, wait. I have to deal with that. Alejandro? You're going to have to figure out what's wrong if you can't hear all right, well, somebody maybe you have is that my audio is fine. All right, um, let's get Ashton in here, yay.
Can you please write your ID number in the chat box? All right, everybody, if you can hear me, shake your heads yes. Okay, thank you. All right, going on now. Um, Azaria, I'm still waiting on you and who else just joined us? Um, Ashton, for your ID numbers. Oh, my voice is glitching and your screen is freezing. Mm. Okay, Alejandro, go ahead. Ashton, thank you, Ashton. And, oh, Azaria, you did? Wait. Okay, uh, here come a couple more people. Wow, we're going to have to stop admitting people or we're going to be really late. Okay, uh, those of you who just joined us, you need to please put in your ID numbers in the chat box. So I think it was Jada. Maybe Jocelyn, and then of course we had Alejandro already. Thanks, Jada. And thank you, Jocelyn. Okay, good. I'm glad it's working now, Alejandro. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and begin. If anybody else tries to join, um, I'll probably not admit them at this point because we're already about eight minutes into the session. So, oops, I don't want to do that. All right. So what I'm going to do, we're going to start by looking a little bit at last week's work, just to go over some things. Um, first of all, I'm glad to have fairly good attendance today. Last week, we looked at the nitrogen cycle and keeping water clean. And you were supposed to watch the Powtoon and write some answer, write and answer the questions. And then if you did also complete a, a model of the nitrogen cycle, I asked you to do that as well. I didn't take off points this time for not including the model, but um, that was just because I had enough great grading as it was. So let's look at some of your responses. And it's not to, what what they have wrong or anything like that just to understand a little bit more about what were some of the common mistakes that I saw so number one a lot of people had problems with it says how does nitrogen get from the air to the plants some people would just say that the plants took up the the nitrogen but the nitrogen there's a problem the nitrogen is not in a form that the plants can use so first, what happens is that there's some special bacteria that live in the roots of some plants, and they are able to take the N2, which is like nitrogen, uh, molecular nitrogen. N2 has two atoms of nitrogen. They change it into a usable form that plants can use. I think it's ammonia. So um, they just change it into that form, and then the plants can take it up. 
Okay. Another problem that people were having was with answering number four. How can we prevent nitrogen from getting into the water? If you put by using pipes, that would be okay if you elaborated and you maybe explained how those pipes were used, but just putting pipes, using pipes alone is, is not gonna be enough. You need to say, um, well, maybe there's some pipes that could carry the water to a place where it could get filtered and cleaned out so the nitrogen's removed. That would make sense to me. Otherwise, um, these were the answers that I expected. By decreasing use of fertilizers and animals that produce species. So it's, it's, the, it's the nutrients in the fertilizers and animal poop that contains the nitrogen and also phosphorus, which is also a nutrient that causes these sort of algae blooms in the water. So you can decrease their use or you can filter the water before it gets into uh, the waterways. One way to do that is by increasing plant cover. Obviously, if you just have soil, water is just going to run straight off. Or if you have cement, water is going to run off, right? But if you have lots of plants, the plant's roots and their stems and everything will start filtering out the things that are in the water and clean it up. And you can also prevent runoff by making sure that um, plants, like where you have um, a crop in a field, maybe you could have a bunch of like uh, trees and shrubs planted, and that would help to prevent some of the water from running off the fields. Okay, also certain methods of farming could work, which I'm not gonna go into that too much, but like if you have contour farming, which goes around a hill, or terrace farming, which creates little steps on the hills or mountains, that's gonna help to prevent runoff as well. Okay. Um, those were the major issues. Um, some people also had some trouble with this last question. When I ask about important reasons to keep water nutrient level levels balanced, um, really what I was hoping to hear from you guys was that that way you could prevent algae blooms from occurring, you could prevent fish kills from happening. And by doing those things, you're going to be able to keep our fisheries and our tourism industries thriving. It's because of all of the algae blooms and the massive fish kills that South Florida has lost a lot of tourism in the last several years and has also had problems with the fishing industry. Okay. All right. Um, with that, let's go back to the assignments so that we can look at today's expectations. All right, so this is a really big lesson, okay? It's, it's a little bit more than what I've expected past weeks. Um, not so much in what you have to do, but what you have to pay attention to as we're going over the lesson. So make sure that you're listening and you should also be taking notes. You can take notes in a Google Doc, you can take notes in a notebook, whatever works best for you. So um, our objective is that we're going to be evaluating competing design solutions for maintaining biodiversity and ecosystem services. What that means is that we're going to be looking at different possibilities for keeping uh, a lot of living things like richness in our species and richness in um, not only our species richness, but our in, uh, individual richness. And, in terms of life, not in terms of money, obviously. And ecosystem services are just the things that our environment provides to us, okay? It's not, it's there so that it, you know, just because life exists, but there's certain things that we can get from our environment, such as we can get medicines from plants and animals, or we can get food or fibers to make clothing, okay, and so on. So these are the ecosystem services. And the reason, one of the reasons that we want to keep our environment thriving is so that we can continue to benefit from those services. Okay, so we're going to start by completing the CK12 questions, air pollution, acid rain, and global warming. We're going to work on those together using ck12.org. So go ahead and open that link where it says complete together. And what I'm going to do is 
And what I think you should do is we're going to just share. I'm going to share what I'm seeing here in my questions with you. And I would expect you to select all those questions and copy them into a Google Doc, because that's where I think you'll probably be working is in a Google Doc. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm selecting those, copying them. And then I'm going to paste them into a Google Doc. So here's where I can open my Google Doc, right? Well, maybe not here. I'll open my Google Doc here. And I can take notes into this very same document where I'm going to answer the questions. I'm not saying you have to do that, but that's an option for you. So the first question is, which are health issues related or associated with air pollution? And it gives us some options, asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, allergies, cancer, or all of the above. Okay, you guys can probably make a pretty good guess on this one and answer it, but don't say it out loud yet. Okay. So we're going to go into the document, uh, ck12.org. You can do this along with me. The document, the website. And you're going to click on science, life science. And then we're going to go scroll down to number 12, ecology, where we've been all this quarter. And then at the bottom of ecology, we're going to be looking at all of these related to, I think, air pollution. Let me double check what it says on Canvas. It says 12.24 through 26. So we're going to start at 12.24 air pollution. OK? And I'm going to start here. OK? And we should all be here together on my page. And we're going to begin reading. I'm going to start reading. And I want you all to unmute yourselves. And when I pause, I want you to fill in the blanks. Make sure you're paying attention, OK? What is this haze? This picture shows a thick layer of smog and dust over a very polluted city, Singapore. Smog in the air is a serious health hazard for people living in many big cities around the globe. Smog is one example of air pollution. Thank you for paying attention. All right, the rest of you, continue with me. Outdoor air pollution. Air is all around us. Air is essential for life. Sometimes humans can pollute the air. For example, releasing smoke and dust from factories and cars can cause air pollution. Air pollution is due to chemical substances and particles, particles released into the air mainly by human actions. This pollution affects entire ecosystems around the world. Pollution can also cause many human health problems, and it can also cause death. 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 Yes, air pollution can be found both outdoors and indoors. You guys know that Although many people are suffering and dying right now from the COVID-19 virus, the, there would be a lot more people dying from it if we were all outside driving our cars as we normally are. Because now, without being outside driving, the air is much cleaner, and that makes it a little bit easier for people to breathe. Right? Probably more people die from respiratory illnesses related to bad air pollution than they do d from dying from COVID-19. So we need to keep the air clean. Um, so from here, if I were taking some notes, I would just say that um, smog maybe is an example of air pollution and that air pollution can contain chemical substances and particles. So this right here, this is an important thing you might want to add to your notes, OK? I'm just going to copy and paste that, and I'm going to add that to my notes. But I'm going to put the notes below the questions, not above the questions, because the questions are what you're turning in for a grade. I don't know what I did there with that. All. 
tabbed over to the right. Okay, um, so I'll just put here. Okay, continue. Outdoor air pollution is made of chemical particles. When smoke or other smoke. pollutants enter the air, the particles found in the pollution mix with the air. Air is polluted when it contains many large, partic large toxic particles. Outdoor air pollution changes the natural characteristics of the atmosphere. Primary pollutants are added directly to the atmosphere. Fires add primary pollutants to the air. Particles released from the fire directly enter the air and cause pollution. Burning of fossil fuels such as oil and coal is a major source of primary pollutants, okay? So primary pollutants are added directly to the atmosphere. That's going into my notes. And I'm gonna put a couple examples. Some are produced when, oh, I'm just gonna put during combustion. Does everybody know what combustion is? Yes. Yes. It's when we burn anything. Wood, oil, whatever. All right, secondary pollutants are formed when primary pollutants interact with sunlight, air, or each other. They do not directly cause pollution. However, when they interact with parts of the air, they do cause pollution. For example, ozone is created when some pollutants interact with sunlight. 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 The levels of ozone in the atmosphere can cause problems for humans. Okay, I'm going to copy this whole paragraph. I'm not going to keep it all, but I'm going to just copy it all. And then I'm gonna take here, I'm gonna keep this secondary pollutants are formed when primary pollutants interact with sunlight, air, or each other. And I'm gonna delete this. And then I'm gonna fix that like so. Ozone is created when some pollutants interact with sunlight, okay? Those are the things I think are most important. All right, so you see some examples of combustion here. They're burning down forests, burning fossil fuels in a factory for some purpose, whatever they're making. Now, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna skip to, I'm gonna come back to this later, but for, for now, I wanna skip back to the Canvas assignment. And I want you to watch this video. And then I'm also gonna show you some other things, maybe another video as well as a PowerPoint that I made, okay? Because it's all related, okay? Here's this link. I don't know if you have problems with glitching or anything like that. Okay, before I continue, I just want you to be thinking, they're talking about creating a greenhouse. I want you to silently think to yourselves why they might be talking about greenhouse gases now at this point when we've just learned about air pollution.
short. All of them from the, the guys who call me Dutch Cook Duck. I guess one of the experts from Los Gatos Research. The Earth's CO2 level. 15 parts per million. Maybe 1,800 parts per billion. But amounts that small are no problem to for a moment because I want you to understand that carbon dioxide and methane are two of um, two very major or very important greenhouse gases. Okay, um, carbon dioxide mostly will come from um, just burning of fossil fuels. Yeah, mostly that because think about this. One of the products of cellular respiration when we breathe out, we're breathing out carbon dioxide but also when things decompose, the carbon dioxide is going to be released into the atmosphere. And then you also have to think, okay, they said methane. Methane is also a very big byproduct of decomposition, okay? So um, these are examples of greenhouse gases that are more closely related to um, decomposition, but greenhouse um, gases can also be created Okay, let me just repeat that because I'm not sure where I started and where I ended. So these examples in the video are greenhouse gases that are produced because of decomposition, but other greenhouse gases are created due to combustion. All right, so we'll continue now. Okay, let me move back here to the canvas assignment and we're going to watch. watch I'm, this Saint Hose. Um, I'm going to open up the Clio first 37. This is the PowerPoint that I made. Um, I'm just going to go through it really quickly because it's quite long. And what I hope that you understand from this is that um, in these canvas pages, or not canvas, in the CK12 pages, there's a lot of different sources, um, a lot of different sections that we're going to be going about and going through. Some of them are related just only to air pollution, rain. You guys take some mute again, please. And then we have global warming. Okay, so uh, while that's downloading, let's just let me just finish reading through here, and then we'll move on. Um, they talk about fossil fuels, and then it also mentions here agriculture, other sources of air pollution include the production of plastics, refrigerants, and aerosols, those in mining, and from biological warfare. It's a completely different, well, it's related to uh, air pollution, but it's a, a secondary effect to air pollution. So, when basically, acid rain, is, you have um, those pollutants in there air, they combine with the rainwater, and when they, when the precipitation forms and falls as rainfall or whatever, 
it has a very low pH. Okay, okay, well, let me minimize this for a second. So here we have um, low pHs, and if you have low pH rainwater falling, it's gonna kill a lot of things. Um, acids can, are very corrosive and they can kill things. They can kill cells, they can kill, as you can see in this picture, trees. Um, animals that are very sensitive to low pH rainwater or acid rain would include uh, mostly like amphibians um, because amphibians, they have to not only breathe with their lungs, but they also breathe through their skin and their skin is very um, porous. That's why they have to live by the water um, to keep that skin moist so they can breathe through it. So, and then global warming. As I was saying, pollutants also affect the atmosphere through the contribution of global warming. Global warming is an increase in the Earth's temperature. And that's what I would like to look at this PowerPoint now with you together. So um, just pause me if you have any questions, because I'm, I'm just going to run through it very quickly. So I made this PowerPoint presentation together with an organization named Clio. They are an organization working to um, teach the community about global warming. So our Earth is a very beautiful place to live. And one of the reasons that our planet is so special is because of this little narrow space between the Earth's surface and the deep space. It's called our atmosphere. And our atmosphere makes life possible on Earth because it traps radiation from the sun to keep our planet warm without temperature changes between very hot and light and depending on like where you live. So if you were living at the equator, it would be so extremely hot. It would be uninhabitable for life if there was no atmosphere and the poles would be so extremely cold. So it's like a buffer between us and outer space. How does this work? Um, well, yes, some of the radiation is gonna bounce back into space, but some will be trapped. And of course, when that's trapped, it just heats up the earth. This is called the greenhouse effect. It's like getting in your car on a hot sunny day. You're inside your car, it's gonna be much hot, hotter than outside your car. And that's because the windows trap the radiation from the sun, just like our atmosphere traps the radiation from the sun. But what happens when we're burning fossil fuels like oil and gas, and when we're burning our forests up is that there begins to be extra, extra methane and other greenhouse gases that we burn. They go from our cars and our factories and our burning forests into the atmosphere. And as a result, you're gonna get extra radiation trapped. And that's what is called global warming. In 2018, global CO2 or carbon dioxide emissions surpassed 37 billion tons. So this graph, it shows a breakdown of carbon dioxide emissions by e, transportation and electricity are the two biggest um, emitters of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So when we stopped driving our cars all over the place, it made a 34% difference or close to that. And that's why all over the world, our air is cleaner now. But not only that, our global temperatures are lower now because the contribution of this greenhouse gas to the atmosphere has decreased. And so there's less global warming than there was prior to COVID-19. Four hundred thousand years. Our, as you can see, of carbon dioxide in parts per million never ever surpassed three per million until 
right after 1950 or maybe right before yeah right before 1950 right here at this point this was the beginning of the industrial revolution when people started burning fossil fuels in factories to produce goods and now our current level is up to 410 parts per million it's growing exponentially and that's because not only do we have all these industries and cars and things but also our population is growing so more import more people are making use of these things there's a lot of evidence that global warming is uh, occurring you can land ice is melting arctic sea ice all of this patch used to cover in 1984 covered the trunk quite remarkably also glaciers this is a glacier in alaska and this is the glacier um well this one was in 1940 and now in 2004 um, over a decade ago there was no glacier remaining it was complete it had completely retreated just leaving water behind Watch this short video. It's as if the entire lower tip of Manhattan broke off, except the thickness, the height of it, is equivalent to buildings that are. All that ice broke off the size of Manhattan and New York. And this is happening all over. That's a magical, miraculous, scary thing. I don't know that anybody's really seen a miracle in the world. It took a hundred years more to retrieve eight miles from 1900 to 2000. treated more than it had in the previous 100. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to figure out how to advance this to the next slide now. One second. Miss Gross? Yes, dear. I can't see the video and it's you're breaking up badly. Okay. So what I would suggest you do is watch the video after I'm done recording it, okay? And in the chat box a lot of people are having the same problem like nobody can see the video on their screen. All right, I appreciate you speaking up. So I'm just going to continue for those of you who want to stay with me and then the rest can watch once I have um created the link in the assignment, okay? Okay. Can you write that in the chat, chat box for everybody, Jada? Thank Jada. you. Jada. Oh, who's speaking to me? Is that Azaria? Azaria. Sorry, it sounded like Jada. I'm <laughs> sorry. Write that for me, dear, okay? In the okay. chat box. All right, thank you. All right, so um, nature has a remarkable way of absorbing greenhouse gases, okay? so. In the ocean, there's lots of algae, blue-green algae that absorb greenhouse gases. And trees and all plants, all photosynthetic organisms, they absorb carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. So even though we're cutting down forests, if we plant forests and we allow forests to grow, then we're going to have those greenhouse gases taken from the atmosphere once again. And that's another way we can decrease global warming. It's really hard to do this when we have our population continuing to grow. In 1960, approximately 3 billion people lived on the planet. In 2017, we had 7.6 billion people and they forecast by 2050 that 9.7 billion people will be living on planet Earth. And with that, that means we're going to be destroying more habitats, destroying more trees, using more cars, and so on. Obviously, this is not a really good scenario.
Texas Food and Agricultural Organization estimates that 18 million acres of forest are lost each year. Why? Cities called urbanization as well, ranching and things. Oceans have absorbed about 93% of excess heat caused by greenhouse gas. As a result, oxygen concentrations in the water are declining. That's killing organisms in the oceans, along with things like algae blooms, which also are killing organisms. So it's kind of glim prospects for wildlife. Some of the results of this have been just complete acidification of coral reefs. So when there's lower oxygen levels, that means you have lower um, pH, the water becomes more acidic. And this, along with just the warm waters, cause coral bleaching, where the algae basically that live in the coral are expulsed or exit from the corals, and then the corals are no longer going to be able to feed the, the wide variety of marine life that lives in this um, once lovely ecosystem. As the world temperatures rise, sea levels rise. Sea level rise is already seven to eight inches higher than in 1900. Almost half of that rise is since 1993. It's expected to continue to rise. A rise of as much as more than eight feet by 2100 cannot be ruled out. Now this would mean that us here in Florida, we would be completely underwater. Here's Miami-Dade today. Beautiful, beautiful county of South Florida. Look at what would happen after flooding of eight feet in South Florida. We would be almost completely underwater in Miami-Dade. So it's, it's very important that we all take the proper actions in order to fight global warming and to improve our planet's um, quality of life, not just for ourselves, but for all living creatures. All right, um, since we're getting close to the end of our hour of scheduled time, I do want to uh, tell you exactly what I expect you to do for the assignment this week. First of all, I expect you to finish reading and watching the vid videos that are on these sections of ck12.org and complete the answering of the questions after you're done or while you're taking notes from ck12.org, okay? You can also watch this other video that's right here. We might actually watch this before we go today. Um, and then along with the questions that you're supposed to answer, I want you to also write this, okay? What would you do if you were president? Write a short speech about what you would change in order to improve air pollution and decrease global warming if you were president. Or you can create a campaign advertisement that illustrates and describes what you would do. Your speech should include at least four actions that you would implement across the United States to help. Or if you're doing the campaign ad, you should include, include four pictures with captions explaining what will be done. So, not only are you answering the questions and taking notes, you're also writing either the speech or the campaign ad. Are there any questions? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and show this other video before we say sayonara, baby. Uh, 
Oh, maybe this isn't the video. This is maybe, oh, I think it has a video and a reading. I can't remember. I made this assignment about six days ago. Let me just check real quick. Yeah, here it is. I'm saying the prescription of pharmacy. Any idea how much it will cost? You have a choice. Is it insurance or NRS? I have insurance. Me, insurance is not what it used to be. We don't spend the money on my prescriptions. Hmm. I recommend NRS. You get free coupons, the same way as prescriptions. A long ad. Sorry about that. Download the free app today. When we see this kind of profound shutting down of the transportation sector, so much of the industry, our economy, uh, that does indicate uh, a lot of critical firms are dropping uh, in their concentrations uh, on the order of 30%, say, uh, in some major cities. Um, so we see that air quality rapidly improving in those places. That's a quick, you know, that's a temporary. Are there specific areas where we have seen market reduction in the amount of greenhouse gases that are being output as the pandemic has has worsened? Within a week or so of the Bay Area in California, for example, uh, going under a lot of those restrictions, air quality improvement by 30 percent in about a week or so. So these are these are significant. We have seen what look like reductions of 10 to 30 percent uh, in northeast China uh, and the industrial part of northern Italy. Um, over as short as like a few week periods, um, you know, as we started to see the, the virus really hit and some of these restrictions on people's movement and industry going into place. So the, number, the numbers are big. Are there any historical references that give us a point of comparison? Thinking about you know, recent, uh, recessions, 2008, um, we have seen reductions in greenhouse gas emissions when the economy slows down uh, a little bit. In the past, it hasn't generally been reversals, but noticeable declines. And even if we go back earlier, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Eastern European bloc, there you actually did see reductions uh, in greenhouse gas emissions over five-year periods or even longer associated with this really kind of cataclysmic reduction in economic activity. So ideally, you don't want to see the reductions uh, you know, with the, uh, in emissions accompanying these big recessions and suffering. I think there's another path, really the more effective path uh, is moving towards more energy efficiency and less carbon um, for brain and economic activity. I think another really interesting question is related to how vulnerable we are as a society to shocks. And I do worry that as we think about climate shocks, whether it's simultaneous crop failures in multiple regions or a year where we have a big fire season in the western U.S. and a big hurricane in the east. Are we as resilient as we think we are, even in the areas that don't get directly affected, right? Because we're all connected and we just sort of assumed that we wouldn't break the bank, um, whether it's insurance funds or having enough emergency responders. Hospitals, obviously, we're learning are more vulnerable than a lot of us realize. What do you, what would you pick the odds at of whether that actually leads to a long-term societal change when we do, you know, get to the other side of the, the pandemic stage of this? Right now, we're seeing this huge drop in, in activity and in travel, for example. Um, when we get through this terrible crisis, as you say, we will, will people replace that lost activity? Are we just going to buy up all the things we didn't buy during that time? Um, even if we don't do that, will we just kind of return to the activities uh, of the past? Because really, to reduce our emissions, we need major changes. So that gets some interesting questions, right? Like, are people maybe after this going to say, hey, video conferencing has improved a lot. Um, supervisors are more understanding than they used to be. Maybe I won't drive into work five days a week in the future. Maybe I won't have to fly to so many conferences this week. You know, myself as a climate scientist, if we turn the dial enough, if we as a society respond to this crisis in the ways that we do over time in the future, by 10, 20 years, we reduce our emissions a lot, that's where it can be decisive. 
then we can stabilize the greenhouse gas above the tree. Maybe even get to a point where we're pulling more carbon in the atmosphere than we're applying, and we can start to see some climate recovery. That's the hope, but it's going to take an ambitious act. Okay, well, that's a brave undertaking that we should all undertake. I mean, I, I really think that we should all do, but um, what, what will we do is the question when nobody's forcing us to stay at home. Are we gonna stay at home? When nobody's forcing us to, um, you know, not go out and spend time, um, doing recreational activities all the time out, outside our homes. Are we gonna stay at home? Are we gonna stop flying the friendly skies? It, it makes it harder when we're not forced to, to do those things because of the virus. So um, what I'd like you to do now, if you would, is just, um, I'm gonna have you join into some breakout rooms for a few minutes and just discuss what you think would be your presidential platform for decreasing air pollution and global warming, okay? So when you get into your breakout rooms, you're just gonna talk with the other people in your rooms, okay? And I'm gonna sneak peeks into your rooms and um, just listen in a bit and hear what your ideas are. So make sure that you're contributing because you might be getting some participation points for doing this, okay? Go ahead. I'm gonna assign you to two different rooms because there's only a few of us left here. Enjoy your conversations. Okay, welcome back everybody. So you guys had some time to share with one another what you thought would be effective. Um, let's uh, hear from each of you on your ideas. Diana. Diana. Okay, let me try somebody else. Samuel, can you tell us what you shared in your meeting? For what I think would be best to do was to Just tell me one thing. thing was
If you were the president, what would you um, try to have, or what would you try to do, or what would you do in order to make sure that pollution and global warming decreased? I have, how about that for one, I have an, how about, um, for factories that, there are factories that still exist that you, that still use fossil fuels in producing, that pr to produce products, I think to maybe find, to make it so that they would use alternatives, alternative sources of energy to help make those product, products as a way to to stop the stop the their their intake, the their carbon intake that that they have on the environment. Good job, Samuel. That's excellent. So, if you were president, you could actually help to make sure that legislation was passed. It would um, prohibit businesses from doing anything except for using alternative. Um, alternative energy sources. Okay, Kira, you wanted to share something? Um, what I said was to make Greta Thunberg like head of the Senate. Okay, can you explain to the class why? Um, because she's a, a real big supporter of like environmental rights and like, like reducing global warming, so yeah. Anybody else want to share before we end the meeting? I hope you have a great week and please send me an email if you have any questions, okay? Bye.